Welcome to the video lecture series of Narajol Raj College. I am Pragya Paramita Mondol, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English and IQAC Coordinator, Narajol Raj College. Today we shall be doing the poem Bora Ring by Judith Rai from paper DSA 2, World Literatures, for 5th semester English Honours under Vidyasagar University. Before we begin the poem, we shall try to understand the background and the context of the poem. So Bora Ring is a poem about the Aboriginal people of Australia and Judith Wright is one of the major literary voices emerging out of Australia. This poem Bora Ring, therefore, is certainly lodged in the post-colonial context of Australia. We should therefore try to understand uh, uh, the idea of post-coloniality and subsequently explore other conceptual aspects of this poem. So what is post-coloniality? Now there are different uh, ways to approach this question so far as our understanding of cultural histories, of power hierarchies, of structures of dominance, as well as of historical and narrative agency is concerned. However, broadly speaking, as the term post in the word post-colonial suggests, anything which uh, follows the colonial experience may be termed as being post-colonial. Uh, the word post-colonial in uh, a way, therefore, uh, refers to a, a persistent cultural legacy of a nation that uh, has experienced colonialism and imperialism. Uh, for example, Bill Ashcroft, Griffiths and uh, Tiffin suggest that the term post-colonial may be used to describe all cultures that are affected by the imperial process until the present time. Uh, Post-coloniality, in a sense, therefore, is a continuum and uh, countries that were previous colonies that were former colonies but have now attained uh, political independence or have now been officially decolonized continue to be a part of the post-colonial experience because although the binary of uh, the colonizer and the colonized uh, has been destabilized, it no longer exists, there are certain shifting and interconnected structures of dominance and resistance within the post-colonial space that uh, allows people emerging from uh, socio-political and economic uh, domination to reclaim their sovereignty and uh, uh, to negotiate the space uh, to create their own sense of identity, uh, of personhood, of uh, dignity as human beings, as well as uh, to claim their political rights and entitlements as equal citizens. So uh, how did colonization begin in Australia? We find that in 1770, Captain James Cook of uh, the Royal British Navy uh, arrives in the east coast of Australia. Uh, before Captain James Cook, the Dutch uh, navigators had considered the idea of uh, settling in Australia, but they were doubtful about uh, the land value of Australia because the continent of Australia was uh, to a certain extent barren and arid. But Captain James Cook convinced the English authorities uh, of uh, the utility of the Australian uh, land, of its fertility. He convinced them, he assured them and uh, we find then uh, after uh, 1770, in 1788, uh, Captain Arthur Phillips uh, arrives with the first fleet and he creates uh, the first English colony in New South Wales. So the English authorities were uh, primarily interested in creating a penal colony in Australia, that is a convict settlement. They had uh, already lost 13 colonies in the North American continent uh, due to the American War of Independence and uh, their uh, intention was to uh, send the convicts from the English prison to uh, Australia. So it was, uh, you see, so as to reduce the convict population in England. So it was almost designed as a, a transference of liabilities, so to speak. So what happened when uh, the English uh, settlers or the English colonizers arrived in Australia and they formed the English uh, settlement and the English uh, settlement gradually began to expand because the convicts who were released from uh, the prisons in Australia, uh, most of them never returned to England and uh, they settled permanently in Australia. There were also other waves of immigration that followed 
and uh, English immigrants uh, uh, continued to arrive in Australia and uh, they resided there permanently. So what happened after the English uh, colonizers arrived in Australia? Uh, this period is marked by violence, uh, bloodshed and a lot of resistance because uh, the uh, English colonizers had uh, to confront the Aboriginal people of Australia. Now, who were these Aboriginal people? Who were the Aborigines? They were the native people of Australia, the indigenous people of Australia and uh, they were the earliest human inhabitants of the Australian continent who had uh, migrated from Asia and Africa um, uh, almost 40,000 years back. So in the, we find that in the pre-contact period and uh, by uh, the term contact, I mean uh, the historical moment when uh, the settlers or the colonizers and the indigenous people first uh, meet. So in the pre-contact period, we find that uh, the Aboriginal people uh, were, were almost around 3 lakhs. Their, that was their population size in Australia. Now what happens after uh, uh, the colonization takes place? We find that in the post-contact period, the Aboriginal population size did shrink to a great extent. And that happened due to European genocide and also due to uh, the diseases that the Aboriginal people were exposed to. So uh, the Europeans were uh, bearers, were carriers of these diseases and the Aboriginal people were not immune to these diseases. Therefore, they succumbed to the epidemics that happened and uh, that also reduced their population size to a great extent. And uh, the Aborigines were basically nomads. They were nomadic people. They were hunter-gatherers. And their way of life was uh, distinctly different from the European way of life. So uh, the Aboriginal people had different belief systems, they had different customs, practices and worldviews. And uh, what defined their way of life was basically uh, uh, the, their approach to a community. So uh, that was a, a collaborative a community approach that uh, they adhered to. And uh, that was very distinct from uh, the way in which uh, Europeans understood uh, ownership or uh, see property rights. So there uh, is a basic difference in the Aboriginal way of uh, appreciating community values and in the European way of understanding ownership. So uh, because the Aboriginal people believed in community ownership, and they were not introduced uh, to the idea of private property. So uh, the, it was very easy for the English uh, colonizers, for the European settlers to engage in this massive land grab. What happened was that the English colonizers introduced a doctrine called uh, terra nullius. And this was a decree that they imposed on the Aboriginal people thereby declaring that all land in uh, the Australian continent belonged to no one because there weren't these formal demarcations. The European de denominations of a land entitlement were very different and that was not the way that the Aboriginal people practiced. So these uh, uh, land entitlements that originally belonged to the Aborigines were uh, confiscated, were appropriated by the European settlers, by the English colonizers and the Aboriginal people therefore were completely dispossessed and they were gradually marginalized. So this was one very significant uh, event that took place in the initial years of uh, the English colonization. The deprivation of the Aboriginal people uh, from the lands that they owned and uh, this land rights issue that uh, transpired into a, a major issue this, uh, that transpired into a, a, a very a significant aspect of uh, later movements uh, that the indigenous people engaged in. So the autonomy movements, the uh, other uh, the civil rights movements or uh, the uh, movements for political rights uh, for proclaiming their national identity. So the land rights uh, debate that becomes a central part of these movements, a very integral part of these movements. 
and we find that in the 1980s uh, the there is this uh, landmark mabo case that uh, where you see the uh, uh, mabo was actually an aborigine from the Torres Strait Island. So he was a Torres Strait Islander and uh, he moved this petition against uh, the government of uh, Queensland and the Australian High Court uh, ruled in favor of uh, Aboriginal land entitlements uh, almost after a decade in 1992 after Mabo passed away. So this decision, this verdict was issued posthumously and uh, that established the land rights of the aboriginal people eventually and uh, that also introduced the idea of uh, native titles so the land rights issue and uh, the question of land ownership that is uh, very central to uh, an understanding of uh, the uh, post-colonial experience of the aboriginal people of australia uh, the other thing that happened was uh, an extermination of many indigenous tribes after the English colonization took place. So Tasmanian aborigines were completely exterminated and there was this gradual erosion of uh, the semi-nomadic way of life that the aboriginals uh, practiced. So uh, they uh, were uh, victims of uh, colonial aggression of um, cultural uh, dispossession, of economic uh, dispossession, of displacement and uh, this, uh, you know, uh, in a way, this, that, that actually triggers our understanding of their post-colonial experience to a great extent. So there are certain issues, there are certain themes that we can extract from this narrative and uh, try to uh, appreciate, to analyze the idea of post-coloniality as it applies to the uh, aboriginal people. Now what we should keep in mind here is that the idea of uh, the uh, post-colonial is, uh, 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 is a plural one. So plurality is what we should, we should associate with this idea. There are post-colonialities and there is not one single post-coloniality. So what are these uh, themes or uh, what are these uh, uh, specific uh, concepts that we can extract, uh, that we can extrapolate from this narrative? For example, there is the idea of land ownership, there is the idea of uh, land rights, there is the idea of identity, of indigeneity, of indigenous uh, nationalism, uh, then there are issues of uh, race relations, there are issues of uh, appropriation, of resistance. Uh, also, on the other hand, we have the idea of settler guilt and denial. So we see that all these uh, different concepts, all these different symbols and themes are packed uh, in uh, this whole mix. And uh, we need to keep uh, in mind all these different ideas when we read the poem Bora Ring as well. So uh, if we are clear about the idea of land ownership, about uh, uh, community values that uh, the aborigines practiced and how these values uh, were experienced and erosion, how these uh, uh, their ways of life were displaced, we should also uh, move on to another concept that is very, very crucial to our understanding of uh, the theme of the poem Bora Ring. And that idea is uh, of dream time. So dream time is a concept that we have to understand before we start reading Bora Ring. Now, what is dream time? Dream time is uh, the creation myth of the Aboriginal people. All civilizations have their creation myths. And uh, uh, according to the Aboriginal people, uh, it is the spirits who that created the natural world and humankind and these creating spirits are imminent in the sacred cultural sites of the Aboriginal people. So dream time is uh, something uh, uh, and we are talking about a pa uh, parallel temporality here. In, uh, actually so dream time is something that uh, the time of creation that uh, e uh, expresses the concept the notion of simultaneity so there is it is simultaneous with the contemporary time 
So the moment of creation is simultaneous with the contemporary time. Now, how does uh, Aboriginal uh, writer Mudruru explain uh, the concept of dream time? He tells us that dream time, you see, is a time of creation that actually symbolizes how all life to the Aboriginal people belong to a, a one interconnected system. So the Aboriginal ceremonies they or, uh, or the uh, ceremonies that they performed and the rites that they or the rituals that they performed, uh, these rituals, these rites helped uh, the Aboriginal people to maintain this connection with uh, the spirits of their ancestors, with the ancestral spirit. And uh, the idea of the dream time therefore enabled the Aboriginal people to rekindle the spiritual energy uh, from the moment of creation. So this is very important, the kind of signification that is associated with the idea of dream time and uh, uh, the uh, way of appreciating the cultural sites uh, and of understanding the symbolism of uh, the rites and rituals and cultural practices of the Aboriginal people is something which is very essential to our understanding of the poem Bora Ring. So the uh, poem Bora Ring, you see the uh, title of the poem is very suggestive. Uh, what does it suggest? Bora Ring actually is a reference to an Aboriginal rite. It is an Aboriginal ceremony that was performed as an initiation ceremony. So a boy that attained uh, puberty or matured would be accepted into manhood uh, during the Bora ceremony. And uh, the Bora, uh, therefore, as you can very well understand, is a sacred rite and it was performed in these sacred sites. So the word Bora is a reference to the ceremony as well as to the site, the sacred site where these uh, ceremonies were hosted, where they were performed. So what did the uh, Bora sites look like? Uh, because they were sacred uh, cultural sites, you see. The Bora sites, uh, uh, as you uh, can uh, in, uh, understand from the word ring, they were actually circles made out of stones or uh, from uh, foot flattened earth and uh, they were uh, surrounded by raised embankments. So the Bora rings or the Bora circles would be uh, you know, uh, uh, in pairs, sometimes there would be three rings in one single site. And there was a large circle, there was a big circle and there was a small circle usually. And the big circle would be of around uh, say 20 meters uh, a diameter and the small circle would be uh, of 14 or 15 meters uh, in diameter. So uh, these two circles were connected by a sacred walkway and women and uh, children were not allowed to enter the Bora sites. The, uh, only the men who belonged to the tribe were allowed to perform the rituals inside the Bora rings on the Bora site. And what did these men do? They transferred the uh, indigenous knowledge, the knowledge of the tribes to their uh, future generations, to the boy who is uh, getting initi initiated into manhood. So they would teach uh, him the traditional songs and uh, they would also teach him about the secrets of uh, the religious visions of the tribe. So you see this was a, indeed a very significant, it was indeed a very uh, sacred rite that uh, sustained, that preserved the traditional uh, uh, knowledge systems of uh, the Aboriginal people as well as the signification of their cultural identity. So in that way it was a, a very uh, important ritual that the indigenous people used to perform. So uh, during the Bora ceremony the indigenous, uh, the tribal men would uh, you know, make uh, dance and song offerings to the spirit of their ancestors. So these uh, ritualistic dance performance and uh, you know this uh, musical performance they would be performed by the uh, tribal uh, men and these men these singers and dancers would be adorned with uh, waistbands or belts which were also 
known as the bora bells so the term bora is a reference to all of these the ritual itself the ceremony itself the site or the place where the uh, ritual was performed as well as the adornment that uh, the singers or the dancers would uh, be given so the bora therefore was a very essential ceremony that uh, uh, are, is, that is associated with indigenous identity now what does this uh, poem do therefore it is composed as an elegy it is composed as a poem of lament because the poet judith right uh, wants to foreground the her concern over the loss of cultural signification she is uh, uh, resentful of the fact that uh, the, the bora way of life the indigenous way of life has lost its validation and uh, this is what this is the theme that she dramatizes in the rest of the poem now judith right as uh, we know her uh, you know her name is judith arundel right she was born in 1915 and uh, she passed away in 2000 she was educated in the university of sydney and she was a woman of cornish descent so she was um, you know um, she belonged to uh, the generation of uh, the early english colonizers of the uh, early english settlers and judith right while she was at the university she published her first anthology of poems in 1946 which uh, you know is uh, called the moving image and uh, this poem is also part of that anthology and uh, later she published other volumes collections of short stories other books of poetry and she was uh, nominated for uh, the nobel prize for literature in 1967 she was also the recipient of numerous awards she was um, uh, given the Christopher Brennan award and she also received the queen's uh, gold medal for poetry in 1991 and uh, we uh, judith wright was not merely a writer or uh, a poet she was also very closely associated with the environmental movement so she was an environmentalist she was a conservationist and uh, she was a founding member of the wildlife preservation society at queensland she was also very closely associated with the conservation project of the great barrier reef and uh, she was a champion of uh, uh, the indigenous land rights movement and she uh, advocated uh, for the reconciliation between the non indigenous uh, people of australia and the aboriginals so uh, this is how we need to locate the the ideological uh, you see situatedness of judith right the poet herself and then as we do the poem as we read the poem we can uh, explore these different layers and interpret them in the context of uh, the post colonial structures or the post colonial themes and uh, symbols that i have tried to explain to you in the first part of the lecture so uh, when uh, we read the poem uh, the bora ring we find that uh, there are four stanzas in the poem and uh, these four stanzas are composed in the form of a song or a lyric so there is this uh, the constant use of run on lines there is this constant use of enjambment and uh, you see although there is no refrain as we find in many lyrical verses we find that there is a very strong musical quality to this poem that uh, judith wright has presented and it is about the song it is about the dance that were traditionally performed uh, during the bora ceremony she is making these constant references to the fact that uh, the bora ceremony has ceased so uh, the performances they have all vanished and these rituals these traditional rites they have disappeared therefore what uh, should be done to retrieve the signification of these cultural values of these cultural performances this is the 
main idea that she is trying to build as uh, we uh, proceed with the poem. So, in the first stanza of the poem, let me read uh, out the lines. She says, The song is gone. The dance is secret with the dancers in the earth. The ritual useless and the tribal story lost in an alien tale. So the words that she has picked up, that she has chosen in the first uh, stanza of the poem is very significant. She begins the poem in almost in medias res as if uh, she is uh, uh, concerned with uh, a very grave issue that she addresses in the very first line of the poem. What is her major concern? That the song that she used to hear in the sacred Bora sites has uh, somehow uh, uh, vanished. So that is her principal concern in the poem. The dance is secret with the dancers in the earth. So what is she trying to refer to? She is trying to refer to the uh, ceremony that was performed where the singers would be making these dance and song uh, performances and uh, thereby the upholding the cultural values of uh, the Aboriginal people. But she believes that somehow there, these values have been undermined. So there is a, a sense of futility that runs through the first stanza of the poem and that is communicated through the word useless. The ritual or the rite has been rendered useless. It has been rendered futile and this is the outcome of colonial aggression. That is the point that she is trying to make here. The tribal story, as she feels, has become an alien tale, a foreign tale. So uh, who are the bearers of uh, these uh, cultural traditions of the indigenous people, of the aboriginal people? And how do they relate to uh, these uh, structures of uh, indigenous heritage? It seems somehow that uh, uh, the future generations have uh, uh, lost touch with the essence of uh, the Aboriginal values and uh, therefore their narrative, their story has been reduced to a tale, to a strange story, to a strange narrative that is uh, no longer valid, that is no longer uh, uh, pertinent to the question of Aboriginal identity. Only the grass stands up to mark the dancing ring. The apple gums posture and mime a past corroboree, murmur a broken chant. That is the second stanza. In the second stanza, she uses pathetic fallacy. Uh, so she introduces a new rhetorical device. What is pathetic fallacy? where we find that natural elements or objects of nature participate in uh, the human action either by sympathy or by antipathy. So here we find that she imagines, the poet persona imagines that uh, the blade of grass is uh, trying to communicate the sense of uh, sorrow, the sense of agony and misery at the loss of this cultural ritual. So the grass is participating in, as if nature is participating in this uh, spectacle of uh, sorrow, grief and lament. And the apple gum, apple gum is a, uh, an evergreen tree in uh, Australia, which is almost like the eucalyptus tree. And uh, the apple gum tree, that is also trying to imitate the movements of uh, the dancers who uh, were participated in the Koroburi. The Koroburi also well, almost, uh, you know, is similar to the Bora ceremony. It was also a sacred ceremony where dancers uh, would perform these ritual dances. So the branches of the apple gum tree uh, as if is trying to imitate the movements, uh, the motions of these dancers and uh, the song, the traditional song of uh, the, the uh, Bora or ceremony, they, these uh, notes seem to be lost in oblivion. So as if the narrative has somehow got disrupted, there is a sense of disruption. 
there is a sense of rupture in the cultural uh, values of uh, the aboriginal people and uh, nature is very sympathetic to this uh, tragic tale that uh, uh, defines uh, the status the the, uh, the present condition the present situation of the aboriginal people so nature participates in their sorrow with great earnestness with great sincerity the hunter is gone the spear is splintered underground the painted bodies a dream the world breathed sleeping and forgot the nomad feet are still in the third stanza we find that the predominant note is that of immobility what is the uh, poet persona trying to communicate because the aboriginal people were a nomadic because they were hunter gatherers so he or uh, she is trying to uh, the communicate the idea that the figure of the hunter has also disappeared which actually symbolically refers to the disappearance of uh, the aboriginal way of life the spear that they wielded the spear that they used to uh, kill the animals to hunt the animals is also vanished therefore and it has uh, it, it it is shattered completely and the painted bodies of the dancers the dancers used to, to done these uh, sacred paints they used to apply these sacred colors on their bodies and draw figures all over so the painted bodies of the dancers the, that refers to the dancers uh, themselves that has become that has transpired into a dream so it is you see the elusiveness of this dream that uh, 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 torments the poet persona here the idea of elusiveness of this dream which is an uh, you see an extension of the idea of cultural loss so it is as if the idea of sleep dream and forgetfulness are intertwined here so uh, she is talking of cultural oblivion that the aboriginal people have been subjected to so the uh, idea of immobility is also integrated with this idea of oblivion the nomad feet are still which means that the nomad feet are no longer in motion so uh, their movements have ceased that is uh, this this is the sense that she is trying to convey here only the rider's heart holds at a sightless shadow an unsaid word that fastens in the blood of the ancient curse the fear as old as cain the final stanza is very significant she talks about a rider so as if you know the rider is ever vigilant and uh, the rider is actually an you know, expression uh, a metaphoric extension of uh, the poet persona here the rider seems uh, to be the the, uh, the uh, he or she the rider here resembles or symbolizes an extension of the poet persona who is willing to revisit these sacred sites the sacred bora sites and uh, to uh, retrieve the cultural value that has perished somehow so the rider holds the rider visits these different uh, sacred sites and holds and pauses at uh, these sites to catch a glimpse of the shadow that the bodies of the singers and the dancers have now been reduced to so the song and the dance as well as the singers and the dancers who perform them have been reduced to mere shadows and these uh, shadows are invisible therefore they are sightless so this is a reference to the invisibilization of the aboriginal people to the way in which they have been obliterated from uh, the consciousness of uh, uh, the and the identity of australian nationhood so an unsaid word this is very significant she talks about an unsaid word a word that could not be uttered or should not be uttered 
so uh, uh, she feels that the world somehow is ignoble something that should not be called up why because it fastens the blood of the ancient curse so what is this cursed word that she feels reluctant to utter this word might be betrayal for example this word might be murder might be homicide because you see she has uh, made use of a biblical allusion at the end of the stanza in the last line of the poem she has made a reference to cain and uh, we uh, very well know uh, about the story of cain and abel from uh, the bible from the old testament where cain the committed fratricide because uh, he was jealous of his brother uh, abel therefore he murdered uh, his own brother so here the poet is trying to make a reference to the idea of betrayal how uh, the english colonizers have betrayed their uh, fellow citizens have betrayed their fellow settlers and uh, have uh, committed genocide have committed bloodshed and have uh, created this empire this colony at the cost of uh, the lives of the aboriginal people at the cost of uh, their uh, cultural uh, uh, value at the cost of their cultural loss so this is how she ends the poem the images that are very significant in the poem are and uh, they recur throughout the poem are uh, those related to the song and the dance movements the motif of uh, the, the story the tale the narration that is ongoing that uh, needs to be built and rebuilt in order uh, for the poet to validate in order for people to validate uh, the uh, aboriginal identity and uh, aboriginal integrity so the hunter the figure of the hunter that uh, comes up in the third stanza is followed by the figure of the writer as if these two figures are juxtaposed here the absence of the hunter is uh, uh, as if attested by the presence of uh, the rider who is trying to retrieve the remnants of uh, his or her cultural past and thereby uh, reinforce uh, the tale thereby uh, uh, integrate the remnants the fragments that are scattered everywhere and to rebuild the narrative of uh, aboriginal history the narrative of aboriginal culture so this is how we uh, can read uh, the poem the uh, language of the poem as you can see is lyrical it is uh, uh, lucid and simplistic and the images that she has used are mostly drawn from aboriginal history from aboriginal culture from the world of nature so this is how she is trying to connect to the cultural past and that is also her uh, uh, the point that she is trying to make here how uh, the cultural past needs to be reanalyzed how it needs to be Uh, understood how it needs to be appreciated by uh, the future generations by posterity in order for it to be uh, preserved in order for it to be valued so this is the what uh, we gather from the poem and uh, in our subsequent lectures we will try to explore some other aspects of this poem thank you